thank you guys all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, we've had it a successful day one of our 27th um, Tulane Environmental and Energy Law Summit. We're so excited. Um, and I just want to take the moment to just uh, thank everyone who was involved in making this happen. So like this is our summit director, Charles Lally. have all the summit board um, um, our members like stand up. Zoe, you starting you. Alex is our tech chair. Brian Anderson was our um, design chair. Savannah was a speaker chair. Malcolm was a speaker chair. Am I missing anyone? Sorry, if you guys aren't standing, I can't see you guys all in this room. <laughs> oh, and Haley was logistics chair. Emily was hospitality chair. Sorry, we're all, look. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you guys all so much, and yeah, it was a lot of work. We've been working on this since um, we got elected, pretty much, and it's been exciting. We have like over 50 speakers, uh, 16 panels, uh, and our keynote, and we're going to open up the floor to uh, President Fitz to introduce our speaker. Oh. My bad, Will. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, welcome. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to the 27th annual uh, law and policy, environmental law and policy summit uh, here at Tulane University. And I have to say, um, 27th, it's, it's incredible. It says something about this law school, uh, this university, that you have been leading in this area for 27 years. And I say this because I just re um, returned from the first uh, annual Tulane Book Festival, um, and that we're starting at, at, at a little bit behind you in terms of time, but hopefully we'll catch up uh, this time. Because quite frankly, um, Tulane Law School, Tulane University, has an incredible, incredible history uh, in, in this, uh, this space. It, literally, I don't think there's any university, any law school that has been a leader uh, in this way. Now, part of it, obviously, is um, environmental issues are critically important to us, given our location, uh, where we are. Uh, we're also at the center of the uh, energy industry. So we have to, in a sense, confront environmental issues like uh, virtually no other place uh, in the country. And I think of all the different centers in this law school, it's, it's, it's incredible to me, um, and you may not know it, but in a former life, I was a law dean. So I understand how important environmental issues have been here um, at this institution. The Center for Energy and Environmental Law, uh, the Institute on Water Resources, Law and Policy, the Tumane Environmental Law Clinic, the list goes on and on. But you should know, as president, I've really uh, led on a whole series of areas in which we are, um, in a sense, focusing on environmental issues. The Bywater Institute um, uh, was established, uh, the River, uh, Department of River and Coastal Center. We have the Tulane Energy uh, Institute, the Center uh, for Applied Environmental Public Health, number one in the country. I always, I always note that. Um, but the point is, the environment is something that interconnects across incredible numbers of areas. You need the breadth the, of, of de various schools in the university. You need the intelligence of lawyers who know to how to think through problems. And, and truly, Tulane Law School has been in the forefront. Uh, now, um, I can't think, in light of all that, there is not a better person, in a sense, to give the keynote uh, for this address. Um, the governor, the 56th governor of Louisiana, um, really is, I think, and I use this, been a true public citizen uh, for this state. Um, and he's been a leader in a whole variety of issues, uh, including environment. Um, let me say, it's not easy being a politician these days. Um, you may have noticed there's a certain level of um, division, uh, uh, confrontation across the board. Uh, but Governor Edwards uh, really has been, I think, extremely thoughtful, and in each area, he's really stepped back and said, what's going to be best for the state? Um, and uh, let me just start out e very easily. His, one of his first initiatives as governor was Medicaid reform. He brought 500,000 people 
uh, with coverage in the state. Think of it, the impact that had on the health and safety uh, of this state. Um, also criminal law justice reform, uh, no, uh, Louisiana had the largest incarceration rate of any state in the United States. Um, and in some sense, whatever you're, sort of wherever you come from politically, that's just not uh, an acceptable situation. He made it literally um, uh, an important focus of his administration. And then, uh, obviously, climate action reform. Uh, again, it's been a priority for him, for him, and you should hear about it. Of course, he's also had to deal with a few other issues, COVID, hurricanes, um, you know, uh, literally balancing all of these things have been incredibly hard, uh, and I'm sure he didn't get to rest on Sunday uh, dealing with all of this. So, uh, very briefly, there are two qualities when I think of Governor Edwards uh, that, that I think explain his success in this area. Um, the first, and I think everybody in this room will, will appreciate this, he's a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, now I don't mean that in the way of the first year law professor in contracts working through every single detail. What I mean is somebody who knows to think through and how to think through the complexity of problems. And that's what lawyers are great at. Um, not I'm not talking about necessarily litigating in, in, in a courtroom. I'm talking about thinking through tough issues and working through all the complexities of them. I've seen him do it time and time again. I think you'll see it in how he approaches problems. And I think his legal education um, is really uh, critical. The other quality I notice is his background at West Point. Um, and, and let me say there is nobody who's more proud of his education at West Point uh, than Governor Edwards. Um, I've, I've seen it uh, literally uh, up close when he attends Tulane uh, West Point football games. Uh, I should note he does not root for Tulane in those games. <laughs> but also, and I, I think I can say this, he was planning to go to the Tulane West Point football game at West Point four days before the election, five days before the election. I actually said to him, I wouldn't advise you to do that. But he, he cared so much about West Point that he was planning to do it up until four days before the election. And then he said, well, maybe I should attend to matters. Of course, it led to his reelection. So it clearly was the right decision. But my point, though, is his West Point uh, background, his military background, um, is a reflection of his love of this country and his care for this country and his organizational skills, as we saw as he dealt with hurricanes and Ida. Um, as you can see, I'm a huge fan of the governor. I think he, a um, lot of discussion these days about politicians and politics, I think he absolutely gives politics a good name. Uh, it's, it's not easy um, being in the arena these days, but I think he's done an excellent job. So with that, um, I will pass it on to the 56th governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here with you. And um, it just so happens I'm in New Orleans to celebrate uh, Founders Day of West Point with some of my classmates. Uh, and uh, took a break from that to come over and speak with you all and hopefully learn from you as you answer questions and, and so forth. I do appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, and President Fitz, that was a, more than a gracious introduction. Uh, Y'all do need to take it easy on me, though, because while I'm a lawyer, I did graduate from LSU, okay? <laughs> I'm very proud of my alma mater. Uh, I, th I want to thank uh, Judith Kane uh, for her leadership of this organization uh, and my niece, Savannah, who actually was the one to extend the invitation to be here tonight. So thank you very much, Savannah. Um, we'll, we'll talk for a, a few minutes, and, and it'll actually be more than a few minutes, uh, but, and then, and then I'll, I'll try to uh, do the best I can with your questions. Uh, obviously, climate change is a huge deal, and it is not a bigger deal anywhere in the country than in the state of Louisiana. That is true objectively. That's not just me as your governor saying it's a big deal here. There is no state dealing with it more than we are, um, and it manifests itself in many ways. Uh, I'm not sure that any of them are good. 
I guess if you wanted to grow a vegetable garden in Antarctica, maybe you can do it now. That might be good. But there's, there's nothing good happening uh, from this. Um, but I really don't think I have to tell you all. Uh, a lot of you evacuated last August, right, to go to Houston? And we, we've actually had five hurricanes in the last two seasons, two of which were the strongest hurricanes ever recorded making landfall in the state of Louisiana. Hurricane Laura in 2020, Hurricane Ida in 2021, and they were tied. Now, there's a third hurricane. It was called the Last Island Hurricane in 1856, but we don't really know how they measured uh, wind speed back then. But just think about that. Two of the three, or two of the two, strongest hurricanes to ever make landfall happened in the last two years, but there were five total. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we have had um, a flash floods. We, we even had a, a freak winter storm. And I know you think, well, what does winter storms have to do with global warming? I don't fully understand it either. I just accept that I'm, I'm not the expert, and those who are the experts say that, that they are related as well. And as President Fitz mentioned, it, it all happened during a pandemic that's now more than two years old. So the, the, the bottom line is the, the storms, destructive storms are becoming more frequent and more severe. And I don't think that that's debatable. But also Louisiana is more affected because we have sea level rise working against our efforts uh, to restore and protect the coast. And we are losing uh, land as a result of that. We also have subsidence and, and we're partially responsible for that because we levied the Mississippi River. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, I think, uh, in 1930 after the uh, flood of 27. And so that sediment just isn't being deposited every spring with the, with the floods and regenerating our, our coastal marsh. Uh, so uh, Louisiana is more affected than any other state. And so I think we have an obligation to do something uh, for the benefit of the people of Louisiana. And if in the process we sort of lead by example, hopefully that, that will be a, a good thing. Um, and so that's why we, we're moving our state forward, uh, both in terms of combating climate change, but also bolstering our economy. Uh, and I, I will just stop here and, and deviate from my notes for a moment. We are more than not a red state here in Louisiana. Um, we're the only state in the Gulf South that has a net zero pledge by 2050. We're the only state with a climate action plan. Uh, one of the things that I really want to demonstrate over the remainder of my term is that this plan is going to be key to investment and job creation, uh, economic development, because this is where capital is going to flow. Uh, for, for many reasons, but just like I told you that we're ground zero for climate change, we also have uh, a, just a tremendous amount of potential for investment from companies who want to make a difference. They want to come to a state that has been a traditional energy state for over 100 years, right, and show that there can be a successful uh, transition. But we have to bridge that gap. And one of the ways that we can, I, I guess, uh, develop converts because there's a lot of people in Louisiana don't they don't know if it's real or not they don't know how important it is and they certainly don't want to spend a dollar more today than they think they have to uh, for their energy but if they understand that this is the key to future investments and jobs uh, I think we can get a lot of converts and so for me the two things go hand in hand um, and so when I went to COP26 in Scotland which by the way if any of you ever get a chance to go to Scotland you need to go um, they really do speak just like you hear them in, on TV. And, <laughs> but the food is much better than you might, you might imagine. Um, and I'm a bourbon drinker, but I have learned to really appreciate a good, a good bottle of scotch now, too. But I went to COP26 this last November. Um, oh, by the way, don't go in November if you're given the chance. <laughs> but do go. But do go. Uh, and and uh, it was the United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties, and they just called it COP26 because it was the 26th time that that had happened. Um, and I really viewed my whole trip there as as much about economic development as about uh, climate change and combating climate change. Uh, and we had an opportunity to interact with businessmen and women from all over the world, 
and there are incredible amounts of capital ready to be invested. And so what my message was, come to Louisiana uh, because we welcome you and we want your help uh, in this transition. So we have the biggest impacts from climate change, but we also have the biggest upside from addressing uh, climate change as well. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I just told you something, and not for the first time, you all know it. There, for well over 100 years, Louisiana has been a traditional oil and gas state. Um, so we, we have been leading uh, the country in terms of energy all that time. But this transition is going to happen whether we want it to happen or not. And if we want to be a leader in the country in the field of energy, you have to embrace it, figure out how you get in front of it, take advantage of it. And so long as we have neighbors, neighboring states who are dragging their heels, it gives us an opportunity. But you don't take advantage of that opportunity if you don't uh, make the pledge, develop a climate action plan, go out and actively uh, recruit. Uh, these folks to come to Louisiana. Um, and, and it does scare a lot of people. Most of you are too young to know this, although I'm looking around at some older folks in here. There are families who for generations have made tremendous amounts of money uh, exploring and producing oil and gas. And many of them never had to go to school past high school. And they look at a transition, and they don't know what's on the other side of that. So there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. Uh, and now, there's, there's a growing consensus, and, and I think the scientific community has had a, a consensus for a long time that climate change is real, that human behavior is certainly contributing to it, and, and, and all of that. But how much are people willing to, to you know, suffer? I, and and I'm, I don't... I don't really use the word suffer, but that's, that's what they use because if all of a sudden, you know, their, their kids or grandkids uh, aren't going to be able to take advantage of the same thing that they did, that, that scares them. Uh, so we, we have some, some work to do. But the good news is many of the things we're going to talk about in just a moment, those skills are transferable. If you can, if you can fabricate an offshore oil platform, you can fabricate an offshore wind platform. If you know how to run a vessel to service an offshore platform, you can run a vessel to, to erect and to uh, service a wind platform, for example. Uh, and by the way, this is not just uh, me saying it. Uh, we actually have done it. Businesses in Louisiana are participating in, in wind farm creation. The very first one, Block Island, off of Rhode Island. Uh, there were six companies from Louisiana involved in that. And, and I'm, I'm not sticking to the script right now, but, but I am so excited about one day being able to look out into the Gulf of Mexico and see windmills uh, and, you know, standing right next to, to the platforms that are currently out there uh, producing oil uh, or gas. I think that that's, that that's exciting, and when we see that, I think it's going to go a long way to just reassuring people. Um, but this is what I know. Over time, there's going to be fewer and fewer jobs associated with exploration production of oil and gas. We're never going to get completely off of it. Um, but over time, and, and that time horizon, I'm, I can't be sure what it, how long it's going to take that line is going to go down and there's nothing we can do about it. If we don't replace that with investments in solar and wind and all these other things we're going to talk about, then we're going to lose. And so this is economic development as we address climate change and we're doing all of this for the benefit of Louisiana for all the reasons that, that I just mentioned. Um, so we want to design solutions that meet the transition head on, that leave our state better positioned for the future, and that's what the Climate Action Plan is, is all about. Uh, I told you before, but I want to say it again because this is important. It's a, we're the only Gulf South state that has a Climate Action Plan. We're the only Gulf South state that is committed to net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. But you have to have a 
plan. You have to, you have to be able to get there. That's really what, what the Climate Action Plan is. Um, and it embraces an all of the above approach. It is a balanced uh, way to move Louisiana forward uh, to be a net zero state by 2050, while at the same time improving health, quality of life, creating a more equitable society, conserving the environment, being better adapted to the impact, impacts of climate change, and strengthening the economy and our workforce. So that climate action plan has 28 strategies, 84 specific actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to uh, put your hands on it, but it has been put into uh, book form. Uh, I would encourage you all to look at it. And we were very honest and transparent about it because there were certain action plans uh, that, that con had considerable uh, uh, opposition among the people who were developed the plan. And they were able to express those dissents. Uh, and, and so you know what, what their concerns are about it. Uh, so it's 28 strategies, 84 specific action plans developed uh, from a bottom-up approach over 15 months 49 public meetings. Um, it was very inclusive. The task force members represent a variety of perspectives, including government, private sector, academia, the, uh, environmental and community advocates, uh, and, and private sector uh, folks were involved as well. Uh, they were supported the work by volunteers from diverse backgrounds, organized into six different uh, committees uh, representing different sectors of the economy, uh, and four advisory groups focused on equity, science, legal, and financial considerations. Uh, and although the problem that we asked them to weigh in on is extremely complex, and I can assure you there were oftentimes uh, very strong differences of opinion, in the end, the task force stayed together. They found a way to adopt a plan that contains far more common ground than just about anybody thought was possible. So the whole state has a plan now. It steers us away from disaster and toward a brighter future. Now, I'm not saying we're not going to have a hurricane this August, although I pray every day that we don't. Uh, I would just as soon not have to declare another public health emergency or any other uh, declaration of emergency uh, while, while I'm governor. Uh, but we do have a plan. Uh, and plans are important. And so, some people will say, well, we're not 100% sure that if you implement that plan just as you have envisioned it and articulated it, that it's going to be successful. What I can tell you is, and we're, we're in a race against time, if we can't, don't do today what we can do today and what we can agree on today, we will never be successful. But I want to get you to think about it in, in, uh, in a, you know, it's very similar in many ways to our coastal master plan. In 2007, uh, we, we didn't have a single project on the books as to how we would restore the coast, how, the, how we would protect uh, communities. Uh, didn't have a dollar in the bank to do it. But we came up with the Coastal Master Plan, and we envisioned investing $50 billion over 50 years. Today, we have the most advanced, robust, science-driven Coastal Master Plan anywhere in the world, right here in the state of Louisiana. This year, we will invest more than a billion dollars implementing that plan. The Corps of Engineers has $2.6 billion uh, that they're going to that they're going to uh, supplement our activities here this year, and and so we are well on our way. But we didn't have it all figured out when we when we put that plan forward, and and while I think we're further along in the climate action plan in many respects, uh, we cannot think that as we gather. Uh, in this room tonight, that we know what technology is going to be available between now and 2050. Because success begets success. And there will be things available six months from now that we never heard of, and two years from now, and ten years from now. But you've got to get started. And you've got you to have a conversation about how important it is that you succeed. And so that's, that's one of the biggest contributions of the Climate Action Plan. And then and on the funding, we actually have a tremendous opportunity because Congress just passed uh, recently, and the government, uh, the president signed it, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, 
most of that is traditional infrastructure, but much of it is going to be focused on climate change. Uh, and you get money through competitive grant applications. It's a competitive process for, the, for these projects, for the funds. You've got to submit uh, your, your uh, proposals, and they've got to compete well. Well, when you're in a state most affected by climate change, and the president has said one of the four lenses that every single proposal will be judged on will be climate change, then guess what? You can be more competitive. When you have a climate action plan, you can be more competitive. And so we will get money in Louisiana because we have a climate action plan and because we uh, are most affected by climate change. And then we will get money to help us implement the plan that we came up with. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. Uh, and, and I'm excited about the opportunity that we have. It literally is once in a generation. Uh, and it's very important for every single state. But I'm telling you, it is much more important because the problems are here are much more urgent than anywhere else that we be uh, successful. Uh, and the IIJA is, is about opportunities to move forward on electrical ve electric vehicle charging, public transit, plugging orphaned wells, hydrogen hubs, weatherized homes, cleaner, safer, more climate-ready infrastructure across our entire state. You may not have seen it, but just yesterday we announced that the governor of Arkansas, the governor of Oklahoma, and I have signed an MOU. We're going to compete for one of the four hydrogen hubs that the Department of Energy is going to award uh, in, in the, across the country. And we're going to compete together. Guess what? I didn't go asking them to, to compete with it. They came asking me because they know how uh, well positioned the state of Louisiana is. But I'm very happy to work with them uh, because they, they are very sincere. They are committed to this. And I, I think we have an opportunity, uh, not an, I think we're going to be successful. I think we're going to be uh, uh, successful in getting uh, awarded one of the four hydrogen hubs. It's going to involve a lot of money for research uh, for all the universities in those states, and, and including the HBCUs. Um, and and it's, hydrogen really is a huge part of our success going forward uh, because, quite frankly, I don't think we or the world uh, can be successful uh, in, in meeting our goals if we don't start having uh, m much more uh, hydrogen. And, and, and by the way, the, the uh, green hydrogen, I think, is around the corner in the scales that we needed. It's not here today because it costs about seven times as much as blue hydrogen. That starts to get kind of deep, deep in the weeds. We can talk more about that if you all want to. Uh, but that's just, I wanted to tell you how important this Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act is for us in addition to the roads and the bridges that we're going to be able to build and, and the, the ports that we're going to be able to, to work on and, and all of the other things. Um, by the way, there were two members of Congress from Louisiana who voted for it. Uh, we, we had Congressman Troy Carter from here and we had uh, Senator Bill Cassidy. Uh, but there won't be another state that benefits more from it than Louisiana for the reasons that I just told you. Uh, it's going to take more than just the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. It's going to take more than just the, the state government uh, entities that work for me. Um, we, we obviously are going to have to have buy-in from a number of folks, including the Public Service Commission, because they have the authority under the Constitution to regulate uh, utilities. And so you can't really move forward in a robust way uh, with renewable electricity. Uh, without them buying into it. You're going to have to have support from the legislature, from the private sector. But all of those people were involved in coming up with the Climate Action Plan. Uh, so they're not learning about it for the first time. Okay. Um, with respect to the private sector, I mentioned a while ago, they're already moving in this direction. And, and the private sector speaks with its capital. And uh, more and more, boards of directors are meeting, and, and they're, they're conscious of, of their responsibilities. Uh, and, and they are telling their CEOs, we're going to hold you responsible when we review your performance for helping us to meet our own climate change goals, how we're going to reduce our carbon footprint. And by the way, 
not, not a lot of pie in the sky general statements, but very specific ways to, to measure uh, what they're doing. Um, and if you don't believe me, just, just consider this. Um, Ford, Shell, BP, BHP, Total, DuPont, Dow, BASF, one-fifth of the world's 2,000 largest public companies, according to Forbes, um, have set goals of, of net zero by 2050, if not sooner. And so when those CEOs are sitting around trying to figure out where they're going to invest their money so that they can deliver on, on what they've been told to do, they want to go to states that are going to facilitate that. It is really just that simple. On the other hand, if they can't get renewable electricity in Louisiana, they're much more likely to go somewhere where they can. And it, it, uh, it, is, it is that simple, but... And, and by the way, we, we just landed a big project, uh, and it's going to help us decarbonize and so forth. But you had this company that, that wants to invest a billion dollars, and they are going to invest a billion dollars in Louisiana, in Ascension Parish. They had a three-page scorecard. There was only one thing that they wanted in Louisiana today that they didn't have, and so we didn't do well on that particular score. But it had to do whether they would be able to access at the startup, electricity generated by renewables, wind or solar. Couldn't be guaranteed, but there was enough other things happening in Louisiana that we were successful. But over time, more and more of those companies are going to go somewhere else if, if we can't deliver it. Um, that's why I say our climate action plan uh, is, is also about economic development, not just meeting the goals, although the goals are extremely important. Um, you know, I kind of jumped around and got ahead of myself on, on a number of these things. So, so, the, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop in a few minutes and, and take uh, questions, but I, I want to encourage all of you uh, to get your hands on our Climate Action Plan. Uh, look through it. There are so many strategies and actions, and some of which you're going to really embrace, some of which you may not be crazy about, and others you're going to want to learn more about, but I encourage you to do that. Uh, and then I encourage you to do whatever you can uh, to promote uh, our success ar around that plan, uh, because we're going to need every lawyer, professors, students, engineers, community organizers. We're going to need farmers. We're going to need foresters, retirees, everybody. Um, so look, look for those things that, that you can get excited about, that you do agree with, and help promote those uh, for us. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we have a lot of challenges in our state, but this is one of the things that I'm convinced that we are getting right, and we're getting it right ahead of others. And you can't come up with a plan, and I, and I suspect I'm going to learn this in just a minute uh, again when we take questions. Uh, you can't come up with a plan like this that satisfies everybody. Um, I get that. But what I will tell you is, in a state like Louisiana, a conservative state, a traditional oil and gas state, if you don't take a balanced, all of the above approach, you're not going to get the buy-in that you need to be successful. And I really think we have a real shot. And I'm going to do everything I can over the next almost two years for the remainder uh, of this term uh, to promote the plan so that we, we do better by our children and by our grandchildren and we protect our beautiful sportsman's paradise that we're all privileged uh, to call home. There's, there's nowhere else in the world like Louisiana. But there's nowhere else in our country that's more threatened than Louisiana. So we, we all need to get busy. We all have a role to play. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop and take questions, and I don't know whether you all want me calling on you or somebody else is going to do that. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes I say I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I've started saying I'm going to let you know at the end whether I was happy to take, <laughs> take your questions or not. Yes, sir. I, uh, uh, Eric Tedder, I, uh, I couldn't help but notice you didn't mention nuclear. Does it mm -hmm. play a role in your plan, or um, if not, why not? 
uh, well, nuclear is, it's, does not play a, a big role in our plan for, for climate action. Now, we have nuclear reactors uh, in Louisiana. Uh, they, they, they perform well. Uh, we, we haven't had any real issues with them, but we really don't see that that's, that's the, the way of the future. Um, and quite frankly, it, it, it has, there, there are a lot of challenges around it. Um, and I don't want to get too deep into what's happening in, in Ukraine right now, but some of the biggest, scariest things are about what's happening to those nuclear reactors, one of which was Chernobyl that they just needed to monitor. Others were actually the, the, the biggest um, uh, active nuclear reactor anywhere in Europe uh, was taking fire last week, if, if you remember. And, and so I don't want to get too deep into that, but there, there are other things that, that we need, that we believe we need to do, and you do raise a point that I, that I want to make. We're alone in the country in the sense that every other state produces most of their CO2 through power generation. We do not. We still generate power, and CO2 is emitted from the way we generate power. Um, but 66% of our CO2 emissions come from in industry. So it's the refineries, the chemical manufacturers, uh, and so forth. And we are, we are doing some stuff around our, our power plants. Uh, you may have read that, that uh, we retired a coal-fired um, power plant uh, just several months ago. And, and we, I'm excited about a possibility that I can't talk about right now. Uh, but I think you're going to see something very uh, positive happened with that power plant being retrofitted um, to to um, get its power in a different way and and it's going to be very good for our environment and it's going to create a lot of jobs uh, in North Louisiana where that particular power plant is but but nuclear is, is not a, a part of, of what we're trying to do going forward not we're not shutting down our nuclear plants that we have <laughs> yes sir Maybe. yes sir uh, Hi, Governor. Uh, my name is Michelle Domain. I'm a third year here at Tulane Law School. Um, so I noticed whenever you were speaking about uh, the economic capital that you plan on infusing into a lot of these projects, uh, one thing that was noticeably absent was the mention of uh, the most important capital, which is human capital. And so uh, I'm from the city of Plaquemine, just 20 miles south of the, the capital. And um, as you know, that is probably the northernmost part of Cancer Alley. And so we have been devastated both environmentally as well as personally with respect to human health um, because of the petrochemical industries that are in the area as well as because of the chemical industries that are there. And so uh, my question to you really is what about your plan is going to address and restore the environmental and the, the human health that has been adversely impacted uh, as a result of the non-renewable energy industries that have pretty much taken over a lot of our communities? Well, it's a great question. Um, I will tell you um, that one of the things that I did when I first became governor was I asked uh, LSU to survey uh, the tumor registry that we have in Louisiana uh, to determine as best we can whether it accurately reflects the amount of cancer that we have in the corridor that you just mentioned. Um, and, and if so, whether those cancer rates are elevated beyond what you would expect. I mean, you know, you have cancer averages, so there's going to be some places in, in the world that will be above average, some will be below average, and so forth. Um, I will tell you, uh, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't adverse health consequences from uh, industry whether it's the petrochemical industry or others because of various emissions and so forth, uh, that survey did not uh, produce a report to me. In fact, that's a double negative, I think. The report that I got back did not substantiate a cancer alley. I believe there, there may be some issues with respiratory problems. And by the way, we're, we're actively asking for help from the federal government now to come in and survey that to see whether that may be happening. But when you, when you take, uh, for example, if you use carbon capture, uh, 
and you, you capture carbon at where it's being emitted. The process of doing that actually captures other emissions uh, that, that are also harmful. And so it isn't just the CO2. And by the way, the current, um, the current generation of technology can capture up to 95% of the CO2. But when you do that, uh, you actually clean up everything that's being emitted uh, to a substantial degree, and that, that would be very helpful. But there is a focus in the plan uh, on equity, and, and by the way, there's also a focus in the IIJ on equity. It's one of the four things that, that every application is going to be looked at. And so you're not going to win funding uh, for a project if it doesn't, if, if it's not taking that into consideration uh, and making sure that, that you are doing better, particularly by communities uh, who haven't uh, and, and participated uh, in the past uh, in, in terms of whether they're going to have the jobs and the economic benefits on the one hand, which is a good thing, but also not suffer the detrimental effects on the other. Um, so I can tell you that equity is a, is a big part of this. I will also tell you that we had environmental groups uh, and, and advocacy groups who were part of our climate action plan. If you read it, uh, you will see those things that they have some concerns about because we're being very transparent about this. Every dissent is memorialized in the plan. Um, so so we, we, we're not saying that it's perfect. We do believe that, that it's a great starting point and it'll get better over time. But I want to assure you that we're doing what, what we can to make sure that we are promoting equity. And, and, and we don't believe we will be successful if we don't. Uh, because we want, to, we want to make sure that there is buy-in, that there is support for the actions that, that we are taking and the additional actions we think we're going to have to take in the future. So hopefully that, that answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, Governor. I'm Jane Patton. I'm with the Center for International Environmental Law based out of D.C., but I have the pleasure of living here in Louisiana where I'm from. Um, I'm actually quite familiar with the Climate Action Plan. You said there were 49 public meetings. I think I probably attended 40 of them. <laughs> um, so, and if, you, if other folks here have been attending, you've definitely heard my voice before making comment. Um, I'm also quite familiar with the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out uh, last week with some pretty dire analyses and predictions for Louisiana, many of which are not news to us, but are certainly, as a person who organizes for hope on the climate in Louisiana, I've been struggling this week in light of the IPCC report. So my question is to you, in light of that report, which I assume your administration has seen, and the Climate Action Plan, and the fact that our legislative session starts on Monday, what is going to be your administration's priorities in this legislative session to ensure that the things that are covered in the Climate Action Plan actually get manifested? Whatever can be done through the legislature, knowing that the PSC obviously is another area of that. So, well, first of all, it's, it's a great question. W one of the things that we're working very hard to do is make sure we can take advantage of all of the funding sources in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act that will allow us uh, to move forward on projects that are consistent, whether it's, and, and I went through most of them a while ago. Uh, so, for example, uh, there is money to plug orphaned wells. Um, and every state's going to get a percentage of the overall money uh, that's available based on their percentage of orphan wells. We're going to get $111 million. Uh, and even though the federal government didn't tell us to do it this way, uh, we are going to, because you can't do 4,600 orphan wells, which is what we have for $111 million, we're going to prioritize those by fugitive methane emissions. Uh, and so that's, that's, you know, that's one small example, but it's, it's how we're going to use the money that's available to us, not just to do what, what the money is for, but what it is for that it's also consistent with our climate action plan. But you're going to see a significant investments in electrical vehicle charging stations, and that's going to come through DEQ and through the Department of Transportation. And we are trying to figure out now uh, with consultants where do we need to put the charging stations that we can pay for, and where will the private sector put them? So we don't want to go and put them where, where they would otherwise be, uh, for example. Uh, I think the, the hydrogen hub is going to be extremely helpful for us in Louisiana. I happen to be a proponent of carbon capture and sequestration. There's not a better place in the country to do that 
because we produce more than our, CO, our share of CO2. Uh, I think everybody understands that. It's kind of what I was telling you a while ago about the industrial source being 66% of our total emissions. Uh, but we also have pipeline density that can move the CO2 once it's captured and the geologic formations that, that where they can be uh, sequestered. So, so that is going to happen. Uh, you're going to see more emphasis on biomass. Uh, and, and you're going to see that in, in multiple ways. Uh, but we actually have carbon negative projects that are under construction right now in North Louisiana to take pine tree waste uh, that would typically either stay on the forest floor after, after they harvest the, the tree or the saw dust at a sawmill. And they will take that uh, and they can actually refine diesel. And they will, they will uh, also have carbon capture and sequestration on that process. And when you do both of those things together, uh, you, you have a carbon negative uh, process, which is obviously very helpful uh, for us. And we're doing that. We're investing uh, in those, those ventures uh, as a state to make sure that they're successful. But we are also going to Congress, and I've been there advocating for a 45Q tax credit that is sufficient to allow them uh, to be successful uh, in doing that. And there's also tax credits taking place in certain states and countries where you would actually sell that diesel into uh, to make that happen. Um, there, there's a $9.2 billion similar project uh, at the Port of Baton Rouge to in, engage uh, or to have carbon capture sequestration on the uh, refining of diesel out of corn and soybeans, for example. Uh, and so, so we're, we're doing all of those things and more. Um, but what I w you're, you're always going to have um, uh, anxiety about whether you, you, you make changes or what anxiety also about whether the changes are being made uh, fast enough. Uh, and so what, what I'm trying to do is move as fast as we can uh, and, and make sure that we do it in a balanced way so that we bring people uh, with us. Uh, and so, I mean, you're, you're going you're gonna to see more things than I just mentioned I as well. Um, but I don't sit here and pretend that we have it all figured out and that I know tonight uh, on March the 11th, of whatever today is, of 2022, uh, that, that come 2050, if we only do the things that we, we have uh, in the queue right now, that we're going to be successful. But I know there are going to be a lot of opportunities to add things to the queue that we don't even know about or the things that will, will be uh, better uh, than we currently think that they're going to be uh, for us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm very, very proud of the Climate Action Plan and the actual, um, sorry, um, my name is Dan. I'm actually the uh, resident scholar with, in, in the uh, Tulane Public Law Center. Um, I actually submitted a question, but uh, after your, you know, um, you know, presentation, I actually have the other more important part of the question, and and I've actually visited this like, you know, after the Hurricane Ida, you know, restoration to this Lafourche, um, you know, parish and the Terrebonne parish, and especially, I'm actually repeating what those people, the residents, are there are saying, and um, the, you know, this Pontishan tribe. The, the very name is actually from the Oak Point. So they were literally complaining that they are having more and more hurricanes, devastating because they literally lost all the oaks forests. And, um, and the actual loss of those oak trees and mangroves are actually not because of the, you know, the coastal kind of like erosion, but more of the land use change. And, uh, you know, looking at actually our, you know, Louisiana actually only have like 10.7 uh, public land and the rest is 89.3 private land, which is actually owned by those oil and gas industries and other private ownerships. So the, the thing is, when you're looking at the climate action plan, I just find two concerns. One is basically the buy-in from the legislature. Uh, and the other thing is the private sector. So how are you going to actually bring up this private, public, you know, people partnership so that these guys look, so there's a lot of land use like biodiesel, you know, the coastal restoration, a lot of land use change needs to be <laughs> implemented. So I'm just wondering how will you convince that two entities to buy in 
in your the, ne the rest of the term. Thank you. Well, one, one way you try to get buy-in is having them be part of the process. So we didn't, we didn't go and meet in secret and come up with a climate action plan and then come out and give it to them and say, this is what we want you to do. Um, just like uh, the academic folks and, and the government folks uh, and, and others, including advocates and, and uh, environmentalists, uh, we had private sector folks at the table at the same time. Because I, I think that that's incredibly important. And we gave them an opportunity to express their concerns about action plans just like anybody else could. Um, but then it, it is true uh, that, that a, a big percentage of, of the coastal lands are owned by private landowners who, who happened in, in many cases to be engaged in oil and gas exploration and production. Um, but those companies are now owned I mean, I'm sorry, are now being run by CEOs who have been given uh, uh, goals. They've been assigned goals that they're going to have to meet, and that's why they're making the pledges. And quite frankly, uh, the, the pledges that they're making are consistent with them being better stewards of the land that they own. So, for example, if you're worried about, and we should all be, uh, CO2 emissions, then it isn't you know, sequestration can be done artificially or it can be done naturally. An acre of coastal marsh sequesters naturally about 80 times as much carbon as one acre of forest. So when we go out and we do um, projects through the, um, the coastal master plan and we restore coastal marsh, uh, we're, we're helping to, to reach our goal but the company that owns that property is also then they're in a better place to reach their goal and and there's nothing inconsistent about doing that with what they're using the land for and going forward they're not going to use the land as much for for oil and gas because one they've already been there doing that for a hundred years uh and 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 that is to some degree depleted um, but also because we're not going to be using uh, the same quantities of uh, the demand, I should say, of, of oil and gas is going to go down over time. And, and so for all of those reasons, and it's kind of a crazy time to be talking about that right now when I saw the price of gas on the, on the things when I was coming in, um, because you know, just, just think about the last couple of years on that. So we had a humming economy uh, and, and a lot of demand, and then COVID struck, and demand for, uh, I'll just use gasoline, and diesel just just fell and so the production fell because you don't need to produce that which is it doesn't have demand uh, and then the next thing you know the the economy starts picking up and they can't meet the demand as fast uh, and and then the prices started going up then you st war breaks out in Ukraine and and it's just it is a real mess but what I can tell you is it's, it's my firm belief and this is informed by by things that that um, uh, that I am reading and being provided by the government as well is that this is relatively short term and this is going to work and when I say short term I'm not necessarily meaning tomorrow or next week but this isn't going to alter the overall trajectory going forward the energy transition is underway and it is not going to be interrupted uh, for any considerable period of time by, by these current temporary uh, market fluctuations th that we're seeing so I, I, I think we have an excellent chance. Uh, now look, I, any time you're, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's going to be always be easy, but I think for the reasons that I just gave you, we have an excellent chance uh, to bring uh, the private industry along who are the landowners, uh, as you just mentioned. Yes, sir. Um, so, like one challenge that renewable energy developers face is, you know, attracting the necessary capital investment for their projects, especially here in Louisiana, a state that's really geared for oil and gas. Um, you know, Tulane has an endowment of like one and a half billion dollars. Do you see a role for Tulane putting that endowment to work, investing in, you know, renewable energy projects instead of just the traditional energy? Yeah, and and I, I did not, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to ask you to repeat the the, the 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 question one time because I I'm not sure that I got it. If you would. 
Sure, yeah. So a big challenge for renewable energy developers is to attract like the capital necessary to you know finance their projects. Tulane has an endowment of like one and a half billion dollars, which like they can invest in various ventures. Do you see a role for Tulane putting that money to work, investing in renewable energy projects here in Louisiana? Well, well certainly uh, I do, but that that's, that's just because Tulane is one of the institutional investors. There's roles for all investor types. Um, and, you know, you, you've seen the biggest decrease in the cost of producing electricity happen in solar uh, over the last number of years as technology gets better. Um, and so anybody who's, who's investing in solar electricity is doing something pretty smart, and it's great for, for the environment. It's really good for Louisiana. And I just mentioned if, earlier, if, you, if we don't have renewable electricity at utility scale, we will be losing out, not just on not meeting our plan. We're not going to get the investment in, in our state. But it's also wind. Uh, there will be the first ever wind lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico in less than a year. We know that there is robust interest. Um, and there was a time many years ago when people would have told you, well, the Gulf just isn't suitable uh, for wind energy development. Uh, and, and that may have been true at some point, but just like all technology, uh, wind turbines have gotten better and more efficient, and it doesn't take uh, uh, the strength of wind uh, in order to, to uh, actually turn the turbines and make them work. And so now the, the most recent uh, analysis suggests that, that uh, the Gulf of Mexico is the fourth uh, best area in the United States of America for wind energy uh, development. And I tell people all the time, I said, if you, if you think we don't have enough wind in the Gulf, there's two or three times a year where it gets to 150 miles an hour. <laughs> you, you, can, you can turn those turbines a lot during that time. But, but, but all, all of these investors, but, but you know, I, had, I sat down the other day with a company, and these, these are all big companies. I mean, the, these, are, these are companies that are going to be investing billions and billions of dollars. They're looking at going into state waters as well, not just into federal waters. Uh, and, and they think that they can actually get it up and running faster. Um, and and I, so, so let, me, let me tell you about, uh, I want to illustrate the point that I made earlier. Uh, we have a shipbuilder in Louisiana who was negotiating to build vessels to actually go out and put in and service wind farms, wherever they might happen anywhere in the world. It was a major problem, one that we haven't overcome yet, that that shipbuilder's facility doesn't have renewable electricity to power the manufacturing process because the CEO of that company wants to build his vessels where they have renewable electricity. And so we can talk about the government's role, but what I'm trying to tell you is in many, many ways, what we are talking about is being led by the private sector because nobody told that the, the company that wanted to, to, manu to, uh, to buy the vessels that it had to do that. But the board of directors told that CEO. So I, I just wanted to, to illustrate that point. I have not been looking over here, so I'm, I don't know. Yes, yes ma'am. Hi. Oh. Hi, my name is Haley. I'm a 3L at the law school here. And um, I just wanted to ask you a question about a lot of the focus of your talk today was on capital investment and bringing more companies here and investing in Louisiana as we hopefully transition to more green technology and green energy. But I was wondering what you're doing in this plan to help combat the issue that a lot of the industry that comes here, the money is not seen invested back in Louisiana, Louisiana communities as it's seen maybe in other states because of the large tax exemptions for industry. And I didn't know if you had any plans with respect to that and maybe making it a little more equitable for people who do have these industries coming in to make sure they benefit from growth in different sectors? It, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that I would point out, because you may not be aware of this, uh, when I became governor, the industrial tax exemption program, which is the biggest exemption that we're talking about, and it applies to all the chemical manufacturers because it, it, it applies to manufacturers, it operated on autopilot for decades, and, and it, it was effectively a 100 um, percent exemption on property taxes for 10 years. And the companies could benefit from that without any net jobs being created. Uh, and it was, it's, I believed it was, it was excessive. Um, and so, and, and by the way, 
The state of Louisiana doesn't collect a single dollar in property tax. All the property taxes that, that, were, that were being uh, exempted would have gone to the local school system or the local police jury for roads and bridges, uh, for emergency services, for the school system, wh whatever it was. So I made a change because the Constitution allows me to decide which, if I don't sign off on an industrial tax exemption, it doesn't happen. So we wrote, we wrote new rules. Uh, and that is now not 100%. Uh, it is no more than 80%. And it operates as two five-year exemptions. If you don't meet your obligations in the first five years, you don't get into the second. You've got to create net new jobs or have a compelling case for job retention. And the locals get to vote to decide whether they want that to happen. And if the if locals say no, it doesn't happen. Um, and so we have already, to, to the biggest tax exemption that we have in Louisiana, we have already made changes to it uh, that have already produced uh, a lot more revenue to, to um, local government than, than would have otherwise been the case. And, and by the way, even though we did that, I can tell you the industrial tax exemption program is still very robust because it remains very competitive um, and, and when you, when you uh, look at other states, it is, it is uh, uh, at least on par with, with what other states are doing. Uh, so I, I, I get it. There are, there are dollars being invested in our classrooms today that would not have been before because of the changes that we have made uh, to the industrial tax exemption program. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Amanda. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about environmental justice and if your administration is uh, kind of taking that into account, because as we all know, um, in Louisiana and in the world, climate change and environmental harm disproportionately affects marginalized communities and people of color and um, in Louisiana, as someone else asked before, uh, indigenous people and indigenous tribes. So I'm just wondering um, your thoughts and if your administration is taking environmental justice into account. Well, we we are, and, and in fact, one of the, one of the lenses, for example, on, on the IJ uh, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act uh, projects, and if you want to compete, you're going to have to show that you've taken those things into consideration and that you're doing what you can uh, to protect communities from adverse effects if they have been marginalized in the past or that the, the positive effects are actually going to, to benefit them as well. But, it, but it's not just that. If, if, you, if you look through the um, Climate Action Plan, you're going to see it mentioned over and over again. Uh, now, w one of the things that, that uh, is challenging is because is there's almost not two organizations who define that stuff the same way. Uh, but we all have an idea, a sense of, of, what, of what we're talking about when we talk about equity and, and justice and, and so forth. Um, but but it is, it is very important. We're, we're not going to be uh, successful uh, if we don't take those in, things into consideration and, and formulate our plans and our actions are, around those. I'm, I'm going to take one more question. I had a 6.30 stop, but I'm past that right now. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Linda Bainham, and I work at, I'm Director of Sustainability at the Nuance Convention Center. Although I'm not officially here for that, I'm here as a Tulane MBA graduate. Um, this is a great conference that this is going on again. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, it's not been officially announced yet, but we are going to have a major, we've had a major renovation to the building in the exhibit halls where we've changed out all the light fixtures. We're going to have a 10 to 15 percent energy reduction in the building and a subsequent carbon footprint reduction. So. We're um, happy to be part of this commitment that you're making. Um, but we also benefited from the energy utility energy efficiency programs. And uh, that is something that we're behind other states in offering energy efficiency programs. I realize a lot, of our incent uh, a lot of our emissions are not from buildings as much as other states. But I wanted to see if you could speak to what the action plan does for encouraging energy efficiency programs across the state. Well, there, there obviously uh, efforts around weatherization and because most people if you own a home um, it unless it was built recently 
uh, there's a good chance that it's not very energy efficient, that it's leaking the air conditioning, leaking the heating, that, that, that the energy that's being used to, to power is more than should be required and all that sort of stuff. So, so one of the very first things in the action plan um, is to have 5% uh, by 2030. 5% of our homes and 5% of our businesses would be uh, weatherized and updated every uh, year. Now, that, that dovetails with um, an effort in Congress because really, uh, quite frankly, that is such a big number uh, of, of homes and businesses that, and, and such a big number in terms of dollars, that without the federal tax credit to get that done or federal funding where there's not a tax credit, it's going to be very hard to achieve, uh, but it was a big part of the Build Back Better plan, which is not, not moving forward anymore. But we know that, we know that, that's, that that's going to be uh, incredibly important uh, to, to make sure that we are transitioning. Um, you know, I, I, you're talking about changes to the convention center. Uh, I just hope we never have to bring in the hospital beds and, and, and the folks like that. That's, you brought all that back because two years ago right now, uh, that's what we were working on, is, is how, can, how can we uh, uh, take care of the COVID patients who were going to overwhelm our hospitals. So I, d I do want to thank you for all the work that the Convention Center did uh, in that time period, too. It was, it was extremely helpful. Uh, by the way, some, some of these things aren't just about climate change, even though that's incredibly important. They're not just about uh, the economy either, even though that's incredibly important. Sometimes it's about improvements in reliability. When Hurricane Ida hit, the only part of New Orleans that didn't lose electricity was a microgrid being, being powered by solar. I mean, think about that. That, that is a lesson for all of us uh, to learn. If we can have more solar and more storage, there actually will be fewer outages uh, going forward. And all of that technology is getting cheaper and cheaper uh, all the time. So look, I, I uh, said that I would let you know at the end whether I was happy to take questions. I was happy, I was happy to take questions and, 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 and what the questions and I think the sentiment behind them kind of reaffirmed uh, what I believed and what I said earlier. Uh, you, you have a, an awful lot of different uh, perspectives on things like a climate action plan and how you achieve them and, and whether you, you have a uh, uh, shorter timeline when it comes to uh, weaning off of fossil fuels, or, or do you have a longer timeline, or you know what, what are the things that you do in the in the interim and, and so forth? And look, I get it; um, it's it's not easy. But what I want all of you to understand, my perspective on it is that in a state like Louisiana. If you don't start off with a balanced plan that sort of is an all of the above approach, you will not have the support necessary to get it off the ground. Uh, and I don't sit here pretending that just because we came up with this plan, we know with 100% certainty exactly what's going to be executed between now and 2050 to ensure compliance. But I will tell you, I am extremely optimistic that we will be successful because we have committed ourselves and because there will be advances that we cannot even fathom now. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have a goal by 2050, you can't wait till 2045 to get started. If you have a goal by 2030, which some of us, you know, we have those intermediate goals, you can't wait till 2029 to get started. And so I'm excited about where we are. Because we are doing things today that we have never, ever done before. We're having conversations that we have never had before. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a, I have always been a glass half full kind of person. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm that way today. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm Pollyannish and, and that I, I don't take things seriously. I take things seriously enough that I want to make sure that we can have the buy-in necessary to get started and to be successful. And I think we're in a great position for that and, and to, to, to achieve that. Um, and it comes at exactly the right time because we have unprecedented amounts of federal funding that we can now 
secure and bring to Louisiana to kickstart our own climate action plan, which will also inure to our benefits with respect to our economy, investment, and job creation. And those things are very, very important too. Because if somebody can't heat their home, because they can't pay for whatever it costs or because whatever it takes isn't available. They're not going to be worried about what happens 2050. And we can lose support uh, for, for these efforts if we're, if we're not careful. Um, so just, just wanted to, to have that cautionary note. I have enjoyed spending time with you all. I'm going to go have a Founders Day supper with some of my West Point classmates. Uh, <laughs> And, and I want to thank Savannah again for, for the invitation uh, to be with all of you tonight. Uh, I want you all to be as excited as I am about what we're doing here. None of our neighbors are doing it. If it was easy, they would be. But what we're going to prove to them is we can outcompete them because we are doing it. And that is going to be a glorious day for us in the state of Louisiana as we address climate and as we do what we can to protect this home, this beautiful state that we all love. Thank you all very much. guys all so much for coming today we really appreciate it and I realize I never introduced myself I'm Judith King and I'm the president of Eels um, and again I want to thank my summit board and all my uh, summit board members and Charles Lally here did a professors we got Chris Delvum here Mark Davis they were instrumental in making sure that we got our summit and our priorities all committed. So thank you guys so much. We have a reception and food and drinks to follow, so please stay. <laughs> <laughs>